Welcome back to London, and thank you for joining us tonight, and congratulations on such a fascinating, elegant, delicious movie. I, I keep thinking it reminds me, of, in a good way, of, of kind of Hitchcock meets Cirque with that signature Anderson odd it's a creepy twist. <laughs> but it's wonderful. Now, I've heard various theories as to, um, I know it sounds banal to say, where do you get your ideas from, but I've heard such interestingly contrasting stories about the genesis of this. One is that it sprang out of your wife's treatment of you when you were sick. One is that Johnny made a casual remark about something you were wearing that got you interested in looking into fashion. And just, you know, could you tell us a little bit about how it grew? It was all of those things. Um, I, I take like about five minutes to get dressed. Johnny takes about five seconds to get dressed. And he accused me of acting like Bo Brummel. <laughs> then I had to go look up Bo Brummel. So when I started to read about Bro Bo Brummel and how he would take two and a half hours to get ready every day, I thought that was a really interesting character. Um, they made a movie about him that was interesting. But it, it was it was just one of the many small little things that lead you towards an idea that is usually kind of half-cocked and half-baked. And wanting to work with Daniel was a priority. Um, and there was a, a thin premise of a story of a man who, when ill, there's a, there's a different side to him that kind of emerges and how that, the, that affects the balance of the relationship between this man and woman. So. Now, instead of writing a complete script, you two worked a lot together on this as it was, as it was developing, is that right? Are you sitting on your microphone? No. Yes. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> I think I'd have noticed. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I didn't mean to interrupt the flow going. <laughs> We did, we, yeah, well, um, we started working together. Um, at first in New York, and then, and then in Ireland, and then, um, where else did we go? <laughs> and then we ended up in Costa Rica? No. Um, yeah. I've never really written with somebody before, but it was really helpful. It was good, I thought. Sitting around the kitchen table going off in the afternoon, writing some more, coming back. It was, yeah, it was good. It was, it was very, it was, a, it, was a, it was a very smart way to work practically because there was so much Daniel needed to get going on to sort of learn how to do in terms of the, the preparation, in terms of sewing and traping and all that kind of stuff. So that we were working simultaneously on many different fronts just to, just to not waste any time, to, to, to get into it, and there was so much to do. Um, and I think both of us always feel like there's never enough time, so it was, it was good to just get going. Daniel, looking back on the roles you've taken on, and Reynolds Woodcock in particular, can you put your finger on what it is, uh, what it was about a character that you were looking for to intrigue you, to excite you, to, to make you want to commit yourself to it fully? Well, this was definitely an exception, so I'm not sure I can include it in as far as it didn't exist when we started. So we worked towards something or other and then kind of kept on re-examining it. And, um, uh, but in the past, uh, in the past, I think it's almost invariably been... Um, uh, well, it's hard to know why one is intrigued by another life as opposed to a different life. But um, uh, but it's always been with a sense that it's something completely unknown to me, and it's the mystery of a life unknown that has somehow drawn me into its orbit. And then once it's got me there, I have no choice but to keep trying to move towards it in the hope that at some point you gain for yourself the illusion, at least, that you see the world through their eyes, just as sometimes when you're walking in the street and you see somebody that's fascinating to you in some way and you just imagine, or try to imagine what their experience of the world is. And it's really just, it begins with that. But with Paul, uh, in this case, and we sort of felt that we, I think that we'd done one thing and maybe we should try something else and 
build from the something from the ground up, and uh, and so it it, um, it revealed itself over a very long period of time, and it was only after probably we'd been working for over a year or so that I suddenly thought, oh my goodness, I think I know who this might be. So it was very different. Thank you. Leslie, um, one of my favorite things in the movie is um, when uh, Alma has shooed everybody out of the house to surprise Reynolds, and he's bewildered, and he keeps saying, repeating over and over again, where is Cyril? It's like he's... It's like he isn't sure where he is or what's happening without his sister. And I gather you two met quite a while before before filming started to get to know each other. Uh, did you two create some elaborate backstory for the the Woodcock children that you were? Well, I mean, <clears throat> we did we did um, we did create some backstory as as you as you have to. But I think what happened really was that we we we. Um, we didn't know each other particularly before we started work on the film, but we met seven months or so before, and we just, um, it was really easy. We just became friends. We became close quite organically, really. Um, so uh, that was good, and that was a useful thing, because then we can, you can, you can, a bit like what Daniel's saying about you, you, you can see somebody in the street who you become fascinated with that you want to uh, you wonder what their life is like and you want to you want to inhabit it we, we could take that friendship that we had and transpose it into being useful very useful for Cyril and Reynolds who had to uh, be able to sit and not talk and be fine with that be quiet and comfortable um, and you can't create that um, you can't just l slap that onto a situation. It has to be there. Fa the foundations of that have to be there. So, um, but it, we thankfully we we quite liked each other. Really. I was going to so say, what if you'd hated each other's guts? <laughs> yeah, well, that wasn't the case. So. <laughs> we'd make it work some. We, other then way. we'd have had to have acted, but wouldn't we? <laughs> <laughs> well, one of the lovely things about sibling relationships is that it's uh, sort of paradoxical thing of shared experiences but having experienced the same things in a very different way mm, yeah. Um, yeah so that we had our shared history but our response our responses to that history exactly. were very different ones. exactly yeah yeah that no, was good like mom always liked you best <laughs> oh n n well n let's not go there <laughs> i don't want to fight him not tonight <laughs> Johnny, typically, a lot of composers have to do everything at very short notice, and they don't start writing the music until they see a film. But I believe you were involved in this from very early on, and I wondered what kind of um, what kind of verbal cues or or clues or references Paul talked to you about, or, or what kind of conversations you had to start writing the music before before filming started. Well, he wanted romantic music, and also it to be quite English and which is feels like a bit of a contradiction now I've said that <laughs> but um just to be very sincerely you know felt and he sent me lots of um, Nelson Riddle and uh, I just try to steer him towards kind of Glenn Gould and uh -huh. lots of Bach recordings and um and in terms of English music I don't know we never really explore that very fully there's a darkness there too. I love how the just with the piano and strings, one sec, one one minute it's it's romantic in the classic sense, and then, and then it can be quite sinister or, or heralding something creepy about to happen in the, in the next moment. Yeah, so I mean, my instinct is always to look for, you know, atonalities and clashes and darkness in music. And I'm in Radiohead. I mean, it's kind of my my day job. So um, this was about kind of resisting that urge as much as I could and. And to be, like I say, sincere and genuine in the romance of it, or you know, not feel ashamed as I feel ashamed talking about it right now. <laughs> <laughs> you know, let it out, you know. Joanne, you've worked with Paul in all of his films, but this is the first one outside the U.S. Of course, you're British, but I wondered what was um, what was exciting or challenging or most satisfying for you from your point of view. Um, well, it was exciting to come back and do a film in England, 
um, and Paul had wanted to work here for a long time, so that was exciting to me that that actually came to happen. Um, I think Paul's style of working was difficult for the British to understand at the beginning until they got into the groove. Um, the whole sort of system between the way the English work and the Americans work. Um, I think it was difficult finding a house to, you know, the Fitzroy house that we had. We looked at lots of different houses and it was hard to find something that was, hadn't been modernised that you could bring down or something that wasn't a complete wreck that you had to like, really do up from scratch. And we had another house in uh, Mansfield Mews or Mansfield Road that we were going to do and that kind of fell apart right at the last moment which was at the time a big deal but we found the place where we shot in Fitzroy Square which was really way better than the other house in terms of for shots and stuff for Paul and had this wonderful staircase and so I think that was the biggest cha production challenge was finding that house and taking it over for such a long time and working with that committee who run the whole Fitzroy Square and begging them for extra days for us to stay there. <laughs> As Paul found more shots. <laughs> Thank you. I, I will open to the audience now, but I just have to, you'll have to all forgive me. I have to ask Leslie a kind of a girly question. Did you get to keep any of those wonderful clothes made for you? <laughs> um, on their way after they've gone. <laughs> No, Paul did say I could have, have one of them afterwards. And, um, yeah, I'm going to have a, a coat that didn't get a very big outing in the film, but I could, I could certainly use that. And I did, I did steal the slippers. <laughs> I'm fessing up to that now. <laughs> we'll expect to see you rocking that coat on the red carpet, my dear. I noticed uh, a Reynolds Stone alphabet on the back of the wall, and your name's Reynolds, and I wondered if there was any connection. Wow, well done. Oh, and what's the typeface of the credits? Well done. Um, I probably should just pretend I don't know what you're talking about, but I, I can't bring myself to, because um, Reynolds Stone was quite an important figure in the life of my family. Um, and uh, he was, uh, for people that aren't aware of his work, he was probably the greatest living wood engraver in this country uh, during his lifetime. And um, and we spent some Christmases with him in his uh, family house in Lytton Cheney in Dorset when I was a child. And uh, the Stone family all together were, were, were big figures in our lives. And, and Paul and I had lots and lots of fun <laughs> talking about names. And, and anyhow, we, that's what led me to Reynolds. You're absolutely right. So... <laughs> He's well my done. grandfather. He was your grandfather. What? He's my grandfather. Oh, who, 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 are, who is that speaking? <laughs> it's not. That's not Daisy, is it? Yep. It is. Daisy. Yes. yes. Hi. It is. I you? can't believe you know my name. I know your name. Well, no, because the re. <laughs> I. I remember. It, so it must have been. How old are you now? It must have been a long 40 time. Forty odd. <laughs> Um, I just had a card from your mum, actually. Because um, I did, I did, that's how you know, because I did warn her. I said that you know, I'd, I've had stolen the name. But um, I remember coming to Lisincini probably about 30 years ago or more, 35, maybe 40 years. And uh, I wasn't sure even if the family was still there. And, and I remember walking through the street and hearing children's voices in the garden of the, um, of the house. And it had a very strange effect on me because it so suddenly made me think that it was us. It reminded me of me and my sister in, in that garden when we were children. And I, we walked into the garden, and, and you wouldn't remember this, but anyhow, and there you were. You were, I don't know what age, you were a child, tiny child. And we anyhow. used to gate so, crash the garden. Where are you? I can't see where you are. <laughs> I, and it's a wonderful... I thing. want to meet you afterwards, so <laughs> will you please... <laughs> and what's a typeface in the credits? <laughs> Is there a copyright issue here? Because... <laughs> And I, I don't know if you noticed, but in my bedroom as well, I had quite a number of your yes. father's... Well, I saw the... I saw I've the got some cash on me, but I don't know if I've got... <laughs> was it, do, the, do, do, did was you it get the Janet typeface? 
Anyway, we'll Joanne. <laughs> we spoke to the family. And we'll, set, we'll settle up, don't worry. It's, it's, it's all going to be... I'm delighted. <laughs> right, to be you. continued. Go ahead, right, sir. Um, I, 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 Follow that. <laughs> I can't, but uh, I can make a reference to the dandies. Um, yeah, a uh, bit rambling, really. Um, I saw this uh, a little while ago. And uh, I was sort of shocked, and I was a bit less shocked this time, so I was able to follow it a bit more. I mean, I'm kind of shocked because, not not really shocked, but it, it, I really loved Inherent Vice, you know, the, the Chandler-esque detective that smokes dope instead of drinking whiskey, and I love Thomas Pynchon and all that. And then something completely different uh, about, I've, you just said something about the dandies, I don't know what the connection is, but... Byron was a dandy. Um, Camus wrote a book about how they were the most amazing revolutionaries, etc. And of course, they were incredibly well dressed. And I'm just wondering what was the progress, sorry, if this is a rambling question, from uh, Pynchon, crazy Pynchon novel, to crazy story about characters that I have never encountered before. And yet, somehow, I didn't understand them, but somehow they seem to make sense. So we have that in common, at back, least. Backstory, <laughs> backstory one can but imagine, but uh, it, it all seemed sort of logical in the end. Uh, and I, I just wondered how you got to that progress, if that makes any sense at all. It, it, well, it's the first time I've ever heard that this movie's weirder than Inherent Vice. <laughs> I've ne that, that's the first time anybody's ever said that, but... No, um, I, yeah, I, well, listen, I mean, I, I remember finishing Inherent Vice and that, and Daniel had, well, you'd, I guess Daniel had finished Lincoln three years before that, <laughs> but it was time and there was an impulse like that it was, it, it's time to get to work, you know, and usually some things that you have floating around for a while, um, maybe come to the surface or maybe your just instinct is to do something completely different and, um, it was just, it was a time um, that we had together. I remember coming through town, having to promote and hear advice and say, like, I'm, I'm, I'm anxious and, we, and the clock is ticking and we have to get going. And it, but then after that, I did, I, he said, well, what do you got? <laughs> I was like, not much, but how about um, here's a man and a woman walking on a hilltop. And um, then I came, had some Bo Brummel stuff and then just conversations keep leading. And the next thing you know, we're talking about Balenciaga, so it, I mean, and his memory was, could be completely different of it than mine. But I think it was an old man and a young woman, and the old man gets sick. I think that's what okay. Yeah, that's that. I remember that as well. So yeah, trying to remember it and now is it seems crazy, but how long ago it was. But um, the, the, maybe the answer to your question is usually I, I'll have a feeling that whatever you whatever you've just finished, you want to get as far away from and try and emerge. And, Try something brand new and challenge yourself and do something that is foreign to yourself. From coming here was foreign to me. But doing anything in the fashion world was completely foreign to me. But it was exciting to get to learn about it. Um, thank you for a really amazing film, really beautiful film. Um, my question is for, for Daniel. Um, is, is this your last film? This is my first question. My second <coughs> question is, were you searching for a last final film? to do if it was your last film. And thirdly, uh, the way that you have um, worked with Paul on this, is that unique to, to the two of you? Have you, uh, is it in relation to you? Yes, no, right. yes. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Could you elaborate, please? Thank you. Paul just said it was uh, a, a foreign thing to him. Um, to, to, to me, as someone sort of steeped in, in Englishness, you seem to capture the, the texture of Englishness in an incredible way. And that's not that, that entirely down to uh, performers and music and everything that's, that we've seen and, and the writing. But the, the physical, visual texture was, for me, one of the outstanding features of this film, um, which is probably apt for a film about materials and cloth as, as much as anything but did you have any kind of quality control um, 
system to get it right because a lot of English people would say ah, Americans they don't understand but you seem to get it right and I'm sure that your colleagues on the platform will have contributed to that but could you maybe comment on that well yeah well, thank you for saying that because I would think I was so paranoid of um, getting it wrong um, that you know, I've got a great Englishman here, and then we got a great English girl, and then we got a great English composer. So, and Joanne's from from here. So, there, I was aware that I needed help, and I didn't want to blow it. We worked with a fantastic designer, Mark Tildesley, who's here as well. You know, um, it was the first time I'd worked with him, and that that the the year of coming here and being toured around and and traveling the country looking for different country homes and, and different townhouses here it was my, my, my real, I mean, I've spent a lot of time here and I've come to visit Johnny and I love it here, but that year of, of driving around with Mark was really sort of an immersion of just trying to see it, see it through my eyes, but also be, be um, honest to all the research material that we had of those couture houses at the time, um, which there was mountains of, because they, they really document their lives very, very well. It's fashion, after all. So there was so much great material to pull from, too, that we could recreate, um, but hopefully not just recreate, hopefully not just, just Xerox, but to, to think more deeply about. and. Um, it's always funny. You, st you get scared. You should wonder when it's when is it going to kind of happen? And then when everybody finally shows up and they're in their costumes and all the seamstresses start walking in and all the pieces finally come together, um, you, you breathe a sigh of relief. Everybody's jobs have sort of have have culminated in something. And you can feel it when you look at it. You go, this looks right. This really looks good. And making things lived in, making just getting all those details right. That. Um, yeah, it was very important to us, we, I, and p particularly important to me. I did not want to blow it, or did I didn't want to come here and be accused of blowing it. Um. <laughs> because all your performances uh, and work was incredibly beautiful, but for me there was also so much more that stayed behind the beauty. In 25 words or less. <laughs> oh, well... Um, I think the thing is that the the world is the backdrop, really. Um, I mean, f I for me the film f the film is about something very fundamental, which is love and life and relationships and how complex all of that is and how achieving that juxtaposed with one's life, whatever one's life is. In this film, it's a you know, highly creative person, um, and that the 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 beauty side of it is um, is a backdrop. Um, mm, I don't know what I can say beyond that. I mean, it, I I think that I think the film is very. Uh, I think the film um, uh, uh, certainly appealed to me because it's it's about the human condition and the complexities of that, um, and in a way, you could make the backdrop. Any, any sorts, uh, all sorts of them. Um, Which Paul has a lot, like with the porn industry or the yes, oil yeah. industry. I mean, they're yeah. very much the backdrop, but it's the human element, which is the yes, what brings you into the movie, really. Yeah, it's but it's a pretty great backdrop. Yeah, it's beautiful, <laughs> and it's more visual than if you'd done one about a writer, say, or a painter, because yeah, it could have been, but gives it a different texture, doesn't it? Yeah, for sure. I mean, it was not lost on us. I mean, I, I like what you said, and it, it definitely occurred to to us, like, you know, look, this is a great venue, oh. and it's great set decoration, but that's what it is. It's just, it's there to to get us going on the road, and um, the details of it are, are really great to help you along and, and to look at. Um, yeah, thank you for saying that. Joanna, you said there was a difference between working in America and the way that we work here in England. Could you comment further on that, please? Well, the whole system that the grips and electrics are completely different, no, Paul? Yeah. Which was, and also we didn't have like a, a traditional like DP. It was like um, a hybrid between poor 
and our gaffer from America, and we brought over our camera operator and first AC and key grip. So they were also working in a very different system to they've been working in in America. So that kind of took a while to kind of work out that, but we had a fantastic group of um, young English guys who are our um, electricians, and the whole so the whole grip and electric thing. And you know, Paul likes to take quite a lot of time when he shoots. It's part of the process. And I think a lot in England, as far as I know, obviously in the independent world anyway, it's kind of very much more structured and you don't go back and reshoot things. And we do that when we film. And I think that was a surprise to people. But once we started doing it, they understood. But it was a different method than they've worked with. It, it was a surprise to me. Yeah. Right. I mean, yeah. <laughs> you could speak for, for it. I haven't you know, made a film here in like 20 years or something. No, so. it, was, it, it was that... I mean, I, I I wasn't sure what that was about, whether that was to do with the difference between shooting in the States and shooting here or whether it was a pool no, thing. No, it's part of Paul's process. And I talked to a lot of people about that during pre-production. This is how Paul worked. But I don't think anyone really believed me. <laughs> 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 and then it actually happened. And I was like, well, I told you this is how it is. <laughs> so it was interesting. Like, people sort of adapted into it. And, you know, really very proud of what they've... Okay. Uh, the part of Alma, excuse my voice, um, was she always going to be non-English or did that kind of develop? No, she was always uh, an immigrant. Because <laughs> um, she know. has no backstory that we know of and she's working in this tea shop in the ho lovely old hotel. Right. You know? We had a little bit. We decided to take it out in favor of it being a little bit more mysterious. Just let her, her accent do the work and this, this sort of... Um, um, and maybe that was a mistake. I'm not sure. I don't think it was. But if you you just need to get the sense that at that time that she's from somewhere different, different, different. Um, pr preferably somewhere east, uh, e Eastern Europe. Um, I know this. I am Czech. It's very interesting. What about the irritating ha habits? That's the other thing. When did they come into the idea? All the irritating things that they both did to each other for which I would kill. <laughs> I mean, I couldn't survive in that relationship. <laughs> Yeah. Um, teacups, teacups, everything. Pour, pour, pouring the tea and all <laughs> that stuff. Um, well, that was always just an idea that we had in, in the script that was written. And um, well, I suppose things that are charming on a first date lose some of their charm by about. <laughs> I don't know. It depends. I don't know what it, your relationships like, but maybe three months in, they start to lose their charm. Three weeks, I don't know. Depends. But that that was the idea there. Did you have a microphone in the pot of jam or something for, for the, to enhance the toast scraping? I, no, no, it's that was that loud. It was that loud. We did not amplify it. I swear to God. Um, my question is for Paul. Thank you so much for that. That was a really amazing film. Um, I think uh, everything from uh, the, you know the, the tone, the style of the film, even the way the actors kind of speak is kind of old school. It almost reminded me of like something like Earrings of Madame De by Max Ophüls, which I know you've, you're a big fan of. I just wanted to know uh, uh, whether any films you watched uh, in preparation for this movie that made some directors maybe that you stole from to <laughs> fit into the... <laughs> That's the right word to use. That's exactly what I mean. Let's... <laughs> Um, Everyone does it. So. The most stealing probably <laughs> goes to Passionate Friends, I would suppose, which is the movie that David Lean made after Brief Encounter. And for whatever reason, not enough people talk about Passionate Friends. It's really um, a great, great movie that we got just hooked on, like repeat viewings. I mean, I mean, I think I must have watched it six or seven times, and I would keep coming back to it. Um, the other one that uh, I know where I'm going uh, is a great Powell Pressburger movies. Well, a lot of those Powell Pressburger movies, including The Red Shoes, um, came back up again. Um, what else did we, we ha what else did we have in mind? God, the list is long. I'm blanking now. There's um, Brief Encounter I watched again just to sort of get, get um, just to replenish there. Um, oh, come on. We're blanking out. What are some of the others that we... 
Those are the main ones. Main ones, yeah. Those are those are the big ones. Um, and obviously, we've talked about Rebecca and, and and Vertigo. Obviously, those those ones and Suspicion, anything with Joan Fontaine. Uh, yeah. Certainly, I know where I'm going. Was the was the one that 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 had introduced the idea of the curse, which was really yeah. um, interesting. Mm -hmm. yes. I love that movie. I was very touched that the film's dedicated to Jonathan Demme. I wish he had lived long enough to see the film. Um, I wondered if you, why in particular this one for him? Well, um, the last day of shoot had coincided with uh, Jonathan. He died on that day. I found out right before we start. We shot our last shot, which was so crazy, bittersweet because he was. If you ever met him, he's the most insanely enthusiastic and supportive person. And um, so as sad as I was at the news, I just I had him rummaging around in my head saying, buddy, you got to go finish your movie. It's the last shot. He was, he was a real hero of mine and a close friend, great man. And so it, it's, that's, that's, that's what ended up happening was, was on this one. Well, thank you all. I want to thank you all for your time and your insights into the film. And congratulations on collectively the four BAFTA nominations, six Academy Award nominations, and lots of other awards and nominations for your mantelpieces. pieces. Um, great. Good luck in the future. We can't wait to see what you do next. And you, sir, and you. And thank you all. Thank you all for being here tonight. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you.